the dilemma between rest and worshiping in the Sabbath. And what will be the difference between those two? Or there is any difference? Uh, because too many times uh, we look at the fourth commandment in a very Adventist way, right? And we try to figure out how worship enters in the fourth commandment. What's the connection between the Sabbath keeping and worshiping the Lord? And um, I guess that um, we'll, we'll find out from the word of God today. I want to just, if you have your Bible, I want to go in John chapter 4. We have a story here, and that story starts with uh, a woman, and not a Jewish woman. It's the Samaritan woman. So Jesus is going to the uh, Jacob's well, and he's thirsty, and he sees this woman there. And Jews didn't have anything to do with, the, you know, the Samaritans. For, I may say, good reasons, at least from their perspective, right? Uh, Samaritans were people that were coming from Assyria or Babylon, and they were moved in the ten tribes. When Assyria conquered the northern tribes, they took everyone from there and moved them out, and then replaced with other nations. And those nations came up, and they start being eaten by the old animals, and they, they sent a letter to the king and said, could you send some of the priests that were a part of the people that were living in this land so that they will teach us how to worship their gods so then we can just not be eaten by the wild beasts. So they send rabbis and suddenly we have what it's called today and what we know in the scripture, Samaritans. It was kind of a mixture of religion. Uh, you know, they added God on top of other religion because why not? If you want just not to be eaten by the lion or the bear, um, you can just worship someone, right? The problem that uh, we find out is that Jesus talked to her, and too many times we focus only in the geographical issues, right? And the dispute between the Jews and the Samaritans. But I think that what I want to emphasize today, it's a part of that discussion that Jesus had with her, and and here's what uh, I will start. And let's uh, take aside, you know, the fact Jesus uh, knew her life, right? And her sexual activities, I, if I can just put it that way. Um, because I'll start with verse 19. So it's John chapter 4, 19. It says, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And now, now... He, you may have a problem with certain things because, let's say, um, gossiping goes very fast uh, everywhere, right? And um, you may just find something about the person, not necessarily because you have a spiritual kind of discernment. And that person will be kind of surprised to find out from you that you know about it. Um, here, Jesus is talking about something that's happening in a very personal life of this woman. And she right away brings spirituality in the discussion. Verse 20, it says, Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. So one of the things that we have to ask is, like the Samaritan, is where is the right place to worship the Lord? Because you may find today a lot of people that consider that there is no place to worship the Lord. Everywhere, it's a place to worship the Lord. Now, let's continue. Because it says, Jesus, verse 21, said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we Worship, I'm sorry, we know what we are worshiping. For salvation is from Jews. So, what Jesus is presenting us, it's an idea that many are making a doctrine from it today. Because it seems to me that there is no more a place to worship. Now, 
one of the questions that we have to answer is why God give them, you know, to the Jewish people, the tabernacle. Do you remember why the tabernacle was given? Well, one of the, the biggest issues why the tabernacle was there is not only to have sacrifices, because God had no interest in the blood of animals. It was not um, paying back God by sacrifices or convince him to be better or good with God's people just because somebody brings sacrifices. Because that's what other religions were doing. So what was the role of the tabernacle in the middle of Israel? Spirit. Well, it's more than that. Say again, Brenda. Oh, the dwell with us. Yes, actually, the, the presence of the Lord was manifested in the tabernacle. Now, just for a second, imagine that you have a, you know, a pillar of, of fire, right, during the night, and a pillar or a cloud during the day. That's a supernatural kind of presence of the Lord. And when you're looking back to Moses, you know, when God talked to Moses and he said that, uh, you know, talk to Pharaoh so that you let my people go. You know what was the addition to that? Because we think just that portion said, so let my people go. And we, you know, we, we think about, you know, coming out of Egypt. Why was the reason why God brought people of Israel out of Egypt? Say again. Worship. worship, yeah, that's true. It's like, a, and you know the response of Pharaoh? He said, oh, you can worship right here, you know, uh, right there in Delta. You know, you, you are having a good place there. Nobody bothers you. We don't like to see you, you sacrificing, you know, that's disgusting thing. <laughs> see, because they were very civilized Egyptian. The Egyptian were knowing, you know, they have science. They have all those construction, right? So suddenly they are looking like the Jews as like a, you know, savages. And what Moses said, no, 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 we cannot do that. We have to go and worship the Lord. Now, one of the questions that I, I want to bring be, before your mind here today, when you're talking about worshiping the Lord, what you are referring to? Hmm? Forms? Because let's, let's be fair. When we are looking and we try to find out what worship is, what's worship? So I'll bring here the fourth commandment. You remember, you have to work six days and the seventh day you have to rest. And nobody has to do anything, including your servants and your animals. And some people say, see, that's worship. And some people are staying home and just take a nap. They don't do, do nothing, right? They, they stay there and they keep the Sabbath. What means to worship in the Sabbath? And for that, I want to just, you know, take you to Genesis. Because in Genesis, we find out that Adam and Eve worshipped the Lord way, way before we understand what worshipping was. Because what we know is that God talked to Adam and Eve. There is no better communication between man and God, creature and creator, like before the sin. Adam was there speaking with his creator face to face. I'm wondering if we can just, you know, be like a fly on whatever a leaf of the tree and listen to the discussions that were there before Adam and his creator. That communication between man and his God. It's what it's called worshiping. How you communicate with God. 
You are communicating by what you do. Right? And that's a question. Because Jesus was looking at the Pharisees in his time, and he was very clear that, yeah, they do the right, right thing, right? Sometimes, you know, they, they were very particular. Even from herbs, they were just very careful that they pay the tithe. So when we are coming before the Lord, we try to use Paul approach and saying that we enter in his rest, right? And many times that rest becomes a physical rest because we are working so hard during the week that we collapse during the Sabbath. Or if you are so much into the screens, you are spending so much time on the screens that in the Sabbath you take rest from that, hopefully. We become addicted to certain things and our mind needs to rewind. Do you try to find out that actually that's not possible? You understand that if you are working very hard all week, you need more than a day to rewind. That's why we call it vacations. Take vacation. Why? You want to go somewhere, right? And change the activities. Maybe you, you start working in your garden, or you take a trip, or you will take a hike. You, you, you go on the river, or do something that will take your mind away from the daily business. But that's not worshiping. That's more like preparing yourself that you can hear the voice of God. See, worshiping comes always in relationship with God. You cannot have worshiping and not having God there. Now, there are two types of God. One with the Lord G and one with the capital G. So the question that we have today is when we are coming to rest in the Sabbath, what kind of God we are worshiping? Now you'll find out that, you know, worshiping means pretty much when you give, you know, priority to one item against your God. See, Sabbath was given to us that we can just have a direct communication with God. We come before him. And we make that connection with him. That's the role of the Sabbath. Oh, I thought that, you know, the Sabbath is between 11 and 12. Because we think that the Sabbath is just when you are coming to a church. Because worshiping means more than just worship service, right? We have that. Because the Sabbath is this time that we have to put aside that we can communicate with the Lord. I want to give you a good example of what it means to worship. Uh, Solomon, uh, he finished the temple. And uh, he entered the temple and prayed to the Lord that every time that somebody comes to the temple, God will hear his prayer. Do you understand that communication with the Lord is true? Reading the scripture, prayer, and also doing good things to other people. That's why, you know, Jesus was accused of breaking the Sabbath, right? Because he was doing the right thing, and people were trying to kind of confine him in their own understanding what it means to keep the Sabbath. So we are communicating with God every day, right? Because I hope that every one of us, we pray. And the scripture says that we have to pray how much? <laughs> yeah, it's like a... And how we do that? Are you praying when you are driving? Or you are listening to the radio, just, you know, the political kind of situation that our country is 
Okay? Let's be honest. You know, it's like a, we, we may just hear things and our passion and our minds will go that way. I was reading a, an advertising yesterday where um, there is a camp that will kind of uh, alleviate you from the addiction to your phone. I'm sorry, it's like if you have to pay money to leave your phone somewhere else, you know, that's a problem because you can do it in your home. You know, you can ask someone, I'll give you $5, hold my phone, okay? So, but that tells you how addicted we are to those things. And you can just tell me that you are listening to great music and you are having the Bible, uh, uh, you know, spoken to you. I understand, but most of us, we are not doing that, right? Let's be honest. We, we are addicted to other things. Fashion, music, food. What else? Oh, losing weight. Can I bring that up? Yeah. So always we are addicted to something. They have a way that they can just do that. So the question that we have today is, how I can worship the Lord the right way? Open the scripture with me in Matthew. Matthew is presenting us a situation where worship is the main issue. Uh, Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 deals with Satan tempting Jesus. Now, when you are looking at temptation, do you understand that Satan has every interest that you are worshiping the wrong thing? Simple. If he can just direct you in the wrong direction, he's good. And he tried to do that with Jesus, right? So we remember that uh, first... Uh, he tried to put doubt in Jesus' mind about if he is the son of God. So he said, if you are that way that you claim, you know, have some food. Chapter 4. And then it, it, it says that he took him uh, to the verse 5, into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple. Where? In the temple. Uh, I may say above the temple, okay? If you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it's written. Satan, it's, it's using a text from the scripture. And I think that today we have a lot of people that are confusing worship with entertainment. The world today is offering in their own churches entertainment, not worshiping. And many of us, we might not make the difference. Because we feel like I'm looking over the fence and I see, you know, the parking lot is full. Uh, it must be that there is a, you know, a very interesting service there. We confuse popularity with worship and look you know Jesus said yes you read the text right because uh, Satan said he shall give his angel charge over you and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone and Jesus re responded saying you shall not tempt your Lord so temptation is part of attack of the church. Because one of the things that we see today, there are some ideas where people are promoting the idea that we don't need a church anymore. It's called this uh, let's, 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 let's keep it that way. The, the constructionist. They, they try to just, you know, it's like a, the church was formed by small groups and they are building up the church. Now, the, the, you know, the people are saying, well, we have to just, you know, make to the small groups. And by doing this, we don't need a church. I, I will argue that, you know, that's not biblical. Because if you look at in Revelation 12, 17, the woman is there. Okay? The church is there. 
God has his church. And if you look at Laodicea, it's still a church. So, you know, those people that think that we don't need a church to have communion with the God. Yes, I might understand where they are going. But I think that the, the way, that, the way they, they explain it and they understand it, it's outside the realm of the scripture. You know who is the bride of Christ? Church. So it's not without question that Satan tries to diminish the importance of the bride or destroy it. Because suddenly, if you don't have a church, the question is, why you are coming here, Jesus? The second coming of Jesus becomes a nonsense. What kind of marriage is if there is no bride? Ellen White says very clearly that in the last days, the church, it's about to what? All right, so, so there is a warning for us because it seems to me that there are some inside ideas that are, are taking apart the unity of the church. And unity of the church is expressed through worship. You remember when we have celebration? Yeah, now we are talking about in the past time. Uh, still, I think that there are some, some churches that are doing that. But I'll, I want to say this. A, a lot of people are saying that, you know, we have the worship team and then we have the sermon. They are trying to divide the church between worship and sermon. Like there was a, a different kind of, we are living in two different planets. Those things were together. But then, you know, the third one, I think that the third, uh, you know, temptation Satan had, he, he's, he's showing Jesus everything. And he's saying, you know, you want the world? You can have it. It's just a small thing that you have to do. What he says? Verse 9. All those things, I will give it to you. If you will fall down and worship me. Do you see how important worship is in our life, spiritual life? Maybe we, we think that, you know, worship is just coming to a church and just, you know, hit the seat, right? We can just say, oh, I was at the church today. But worshiping the Lord goes beyond just being the church. It's having that connection with the Lord. Because you can have the world and worship the world. And how we do that? Can, can, can I go to, you know, talk about the small gods with a small g? Things that are taking priorities before the Lord? You may say that you are now worship them. But as long as, you know, you give them time, financial resources, give your, your attention, and your force or the, let's say, stamina that you have, everything that you do in this world is in that direction. That takes you away from worshiping the Lord. And look at what the response Jesus had. Away with you, Satan. For, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. How many gods you should serve? One. How many gods you have to worship? One. So the, the, the dilemma that we have is, do we know to worship God? Now, as Seventh-day Adventists, we have a different kind of issue. Can, can I open the scripture? Let's open the scripture in Revelation. Revelation chapter 14 is talking about a message that the Seventh-day Adventist has to preach. Isn't that what we have to preach? Do you see the problem that we have with the three angel messages? Because many times we don't know to preach it. We preach it in a, in a fearful way or doomsday type of approach. Look, it's like a, 
I'll, I'll read the first uh, angel message. It says, Fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Why we have to worship the Lord? Oh, yes. Like, it seems to me that we are in a Darwinist class. You know, we think that, you know, it's like an evolution, right? Do you understand that our nature, our human nature, is that we don't want to recognize that God is our creator? Every time when you recognize your dependence on your creator, what you are doing, you are worshiping him. How you preach that message to the people? Your friends, co-workers, your neighbors. You are preaching when you are preaching a creator. When you make that connection because I have value because God made me. And not only do I have value, I'm worship him. So let's take uh, some example of worship. Because some worshiping are force and some worshipful uh, it's voluntary. Okay, so he, he's, he's a, a very interesting one. Uh, probably every one of you know. It's Moses. It's, uh, it's in the desert. And he sees this bush that it's in fire. You remember that. So he goes there because he's curious. He doesn't understand what's happening. And God says, um, uh, hold on there. Because what? This place is a holy place. You see the problem with the church today? Too many people consider that this is a common place. Everything that's dedicated to the Lord becomes a holy place. And maybe, you know, my, my declaration of that will surprise you, but you know how, what holy means, among other things? Because we always, we talk about holy, we refer to God and without sin. But holy means put aside Put aside. You remember the vessels that were used at the temple? And they were just used for the blood to be, you know, the sacrifice. And then they have to spill it, right? Before the altar or, uh, you know, before the, the most holy place right there. In Daniel book, we find out that the king in chapter 5, um, he makes a party, an orgy. And he's saying, oh, brings those vessels that we can drink from it. Because he considered that there is nothing holy. Today, the world doesn't make the difference between holy and common anymore. They think that everything is common. That's why our hand was put on the wall and the judgment was written right there against the king and Babylon. The Babylon today it's in, it's teaching you that there is no difference between holy and unholy or common. Look, the society today is teaching you that there is no good or evil. No right or wrong. It's how you feel. Too many of us, we think the worship means worshiping me. There is a, one of those funny things, okay, I'll, I'll say, uh, on YouTube. Um, there is this person that saying, how great thou art, art thou, you know, that song. And instead of saying that the singing, uh, you know, it's a, it's the greatness of God. He's saying how great I am. Because he's talking about himself. Too many of us today, and I'm talking about Christianity in general, so, they, so I don't want to make you uncomfortable today, okay? But just like, a, put it that way. Too many of us that call ourselves Christians, we are here to worship ourselves because we don't know to worship the Lord. We don't know the difference. 
It's about us, my ideas, my way of doing things. See, the Tringer messages is presenting us a group of people that are speaking probably against the culture of today in a nice way and calls people to worship the creator of the world. And my call today is, do you see the presence of the Lord in the Sabbath worship? Because if you have the presence of the Lord in your mind, then your worship goes in the right direction. That means that you are not here just to take a nap or, you know, have some friends. Yes, we have, you know, look, it's like a, a Malachi says that when, when people are talking about God, angel of the Lord are writing down memories when they are talking about the Lord. So it's only natural that when we come as assembly, we are talking about God. Are you talking about your business and the Sabbath or you are talking about God? Hmm? Yeah, because, you know, sometimes since I see you only in the Sabbath, I may talk certain things that are not related to the Sabbath. Holiness of the Sabbath, it's kept by every one of us. It's not like a forceful kind of thing. And I mentioned, you know, it's like a different kind of worship when it's forceful, in a way. You remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and, and Judas kissed him? And the soldier said that we are here to see uh, and arrest Jesus. And they said, I am. You know what happened to them? They fell on the ground. Did they fell the ground because they were worshiping the Lord? Do you know actually that at the end of time, in great controversy, when he's talking about after a thousand years, when the, the wicked people will be resurrected, do you know that the scripture says that every knee will come before the Lord, will bow before the Lord? You know what that means? Everyone will worship the Lord. But for the wrong reason then. Today, you have an option to decide for yourself to worship the Lord. Look, how you worship the Lord. Stay in the word. Pray. Be part of the assembly. Jesus was his custom to be in the synagogue. Okay? Uh, he was not saying, oh, I, I love, you know, the months of uh, Israel, you know, I, I would like to just, you know, go there and just relax because, you know, people of Israel gives me too much trouble during the week. I would just, you know, go just to stay at the, the, you know, the seaside of the great, you know, Sea of Galilee and just, you know, enjoy the sun and the wind and, you know, staying there. Maybe even fishing. Because it's so relaxing. See, Sabbath is not about relaxing in that way. Relaxing is when you relax within the Lord. The, the, I'm sorry, the scripture reading for today was in uh, Revelation 19. And I want you to just go there because I want to give you an idea that many times we are worshiping the wrong things. And here's what it says. Um, Revelation 19, chapter 10. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, chapter 19, verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. Look, John, it's falling down in front of the angel that God sent him. Talk to him. What's wrong with that? You may say, well, but he said to me, see that you do not do that. I don't know if, uh, you know, it's like, a de see, we are in a positive thinking, right? And even the scripture seems to me that, you know, the way it's phrased, it's a negative. It's like, a, don't do that. Why you're not saying, oh, just stand up, you know, you have dignity. 
No, the angel is saying, don't do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brother who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship who? Right. Worship God. Now you understand what we need to do every Sabbath. Every day. Worship God. It's your mind there talking to God. We call meditation. We tend to not understand what meditation is. Let me give you an example. You remember one of the sons of Abraham staying in the, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, in general. So he's like a, a, it's kind of a, you know, a riddle. So he's staying outside in the yard because he's waiting for his wife to come. And he's meditating. Now, if you are a man today, probably you are waiting just to see your wife because it's your parents and the servant of the parents that went there and make a choice for you. Remember? And he, he's the, the, you know, the, the servant comes with the future wife and where she's finding her future husband? In the field, meditating. How you meditate? Take a text in the morning and put it to your memory. And just try to just, you know, think about what that text is telling you. We have so many books, you know, it's like if you go to, to some stores, including, you know, the store, big, big box store that we have here, uh, you may find, you know, spirituality, uh, you know, or um, religious books. And many, many of them, they have very way, nice way to put words together. And I, I agree that, you know, some are wonderful. But do you understand that God gives you a mind of your own? Read the text and then meditate the entire day and say, what that text wants to tell me? That's what meditation is. That's the biblical meditation, not Eastern religion type of meditation. Because we are confused about that too. Emptying yourself and all kind of other things, you know, that are promoted by that kind of, you know, philosophy. But meditation is biblical. What else you can do? You remember Daniel? Daniel had uh, in chapter 6... He seems to me that he got himself in trouble. You know why? Because he was praying every day at certain hours with windows open toward Jerusalem. Now, let's, let's, let's talk about a, a little bit of that. So you open up a door. It seems to me that he had a, a way to understand where Jerusalem is, okay? And if you understand the Babylonians invented the 360 degrees, then you know why he knew what Jerusalem is. And he was praying all day, you know, a few times a day. How many times? Three times. Toward Jerusalem. Why he was praying? Because he was desiring that God will come back to Israel in his temple. Are we praying for our churches? Yeah, we can claim that our church has problems, right? But if we are not praying for it, that's our problem. That means that it's like a, you know, they are saying that if you are working in a company and you blame the company and you are having a very negative view of your company, in a year, in a year the company will disappear or fell under. And many of us, we are looking at the church only in a negative way, right? See, praying for the peace of Jerusalem, right? Means, let's pray for our church. There are some challenges that we see it left and right. When your heart is in the right thing and you pray for the bride of Jesus, I don't see that there is a loss in that thing. I think Jesus will love you even more, right? If you pray for his bride, why not? Are you in a ward? 
That means, are you reading the scripture? Regularly. See, I, you know, it's like a, look, I mention uh, sometimes things and, you know, it's like a, I, I grew up in a, a different kind of culture. But in, in the old culture, we are having the Sabbath school lesson going over all days, all six days or seven days in the evening. So it's like a, we have family altar and we are going not only Sunday lesson. We are going the entire week lesson. Because what happened is you will have a disconnect when you're coming in the church in the Sabbath and talking the entire thing because by now, Friday, you'll not know what Sunday was talking about. You see, because we divide the things and make it uh, so that it will not take too long of your time. Please just consider taking to the Bible study all way. It's not going to take you too long. Probably 20 minutes. So. How many of us are worshiping people? Let me touch that because, you know, I watch some of the YouTube's discussion about the Seventh-day Adventist. And one of the discussion was, is the Seventh-day Adventist a cult? That was the question. And it's like, a, you know, maybe it's a professional defect, right? You, you tend to just, you know, listen to those things just to figure out where the, let's say, the opposition is. Try to just figure out something. And, and like I mentioned today uh, in the Sabbath school, sometimes, depending on whom you ask, say, because we start having Adventists that have their own doctrines outside of the church doctrine. Yeah, because if they ask you, it's like, a, what you believe? And we have some tough subjects, and there are some simple subjects, okay, about eating this or that, you know, especially we're talking about clean and unclean. And you have people that are going, uh, goes in the, in the opposite way which we have to go. Because they think that, you know, it's like a, the New Testament presents a different kind of view. And they, they bought that idea from other denominations. So, why you are coming to the church? Did, did, you ask, did you ever ask yourself why I'm coming to the church? Because if you are coming or you are in a, let's say you are watching, you know, a certain program. And I see people that are coming and they are Adventists just because one person. Uh, either the pastor or a speaker or somebody. If you are in the church because of a one person, you may be in a cult. You have to be here for Christ, not for a person. Do, do you see what I'm saying? You are not here to worship a person. You are here to worship a creator, God. When we understand that, I think that, you know, we will have a revelation because that will make me feel very comfortable knowing that I'm here and I'm serving my God and I'm with my brother and sister praising the God that created us. That's what the role coming together. That's why we should not leave our assemblies. That's what the, the scripture says. You know that Satan could transform himself in the angel of light, right? And that's where, you know, John was very clear that you should not worship anything but God. Now, I will give you a homework, if I may say. And the homework is to respond to this question. What will be my approach to worship my Savior, my Creator, my uh, God. How I can worship Him in the most appropriate way? Because you'll find something very interesting. God has a way to connect with us at the individual level. 
So the way you worship God sometimes in your life will be different than I'm worshiping God in my life. We are coming together on the Sabbath and worship as an example, assembly, yes. But the question is, what's happening in my worship? What I should do in my life? And how I can just regain the spirituality that I need to have with my God? That I can have that communication where I can walk with Him. Because that's what, you know, Enoch did, right? He walked with the Lord. Walking with the Lord is not an easy thing. It needs to have a, a turning point in our lives. And I wish that, you know, some of us will have that turning point today. Am I coming to the Lord and realize that this is a holy place? Why is it a holy place? Because God is here. You know the difference between the weeks, six weeks, and the Sabbath? Let me, let me put it this way. Every day of the week, when you pray, you invite God in your life, right? That's what we do. You invite God in your life, in your home. And you ask the Lord to be with you, protect you, that he will give you the Holy Spirit to just give you the opportunity that you witness to people. When we are coming in the Sabbath, we are coming in his house. Do you see the difference? He's inviting us. He's already here. But yeah, so it's like, you know, when, when we are late, you know, the angels are coming first, right? Our angels are coming first to the church. And, and that means that when I know that Jesus is here, then everything that I'm doing in the church, everything that, I, you know, it will be directed to him. I will read the text that... Um, David put together. So it's Psalm 95. Psalm 95. I like what David says here. Okay. Ninety-five, verse six. O come, let us worship him, bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture. And the sheep of his hand. Can we say that? Like a we say, let's our worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Let me read you another text and I'll conclude this text. This text is uh, my favorite text. Uh, you know, my dad had a, a way to, to ask us when we have a alt- familiar altar. You know what a familiar altar is, right? It's uh, in the evening, we're coming together as a family, and everyone has to have a text. That's, you know, that's my dad kind of idea. So we will have a text, and everyone, you know, of the children will have text when my mom and my dad, and then we'll have a song, and we'll have the Sabbath school. Uh, you know, the entire week, Sabbath school, like I mentioned. And my text at that time was found in Psalm 122. Psalm 122 says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Now, let me, let me ask you this. Are you feeling glad when you are coming to the house of the Lord? Because David felt that that's the best place to be. And I don't want to just go too much on, on other subjects because too many times people deci- decided to die in the house of the Lord. You know, holding the horns of the altar. Are you happy when you are coming to the are you happy when somebody says, come to the, the church? Yeah, there is no more, you know, COVID. You cannot have that excuse anymore. Do we invite people to come to the Lord and be happy? See, because too many times when we are worshiping, we are losing the happiness. You see that? When I was a kid, I grew up in a very conservative church, as you can tell. But the, the issue is that my years are longer today because of all the people in the church that were just trying to drag me that I should not smile in the church. 
They said, did you see Jesus laughing? Oh, I have to say, because I was reading my Bible. I didn't see that. So, so that, that was kind of, you see, you see what I'm saying? Happiness in worship, it's extraordinary. The fist of the Jewish people always ended with a shout of happiness. The communion. After they took the communion, what they did, they had a song and they wanted Mount of Olives. Do you see the happiness when you come to the Lord? You cannot come to the Lord and not be blessed. You cannot be there and not be happy that you are in front of your God. We are missing so much by not knowing to worship our God. Maybe it's time for us to ask the Lord a powerful prayer. Lord, open our eyes and help us that we worship you in the best way. For that, today, it's, if you have some time, read Revelation chapter 4 and 5, because that will give you a different view of the presence of the Lord, because that's the temple, and John is saying the temple, and sees order and worshiping, and every angel is standing there ready to, to fulfill God's desire and commands. I'll, I'll, I'll continue to read in uh, 122 Psalm. Jerusalem is built as a city that's compact together, where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to the testimony of Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. From thrones are set there for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brethren and companions, I will now say, peace be with you and within you. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Loving Father, many times we find ourselves confused and not knowing how to worship you. Praying, Lord, that today, you give us the, the gladness when we come closer to you in front of you, Lord. And move us with the Holy Spirit in such a way that our worship will be received before you. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to you. Open our hearts to your word and to your presence. Because we ask in Jesus' name.